Well, I just want to say thanks everybody for being here today. And good afternoon. My name is Renee Hawkins. I'm the education manager here with Michigan Center for Rural Health. <clears throat> if you're not aware, Michigan Center for Rural Health is a nonprofit state office of rural health. And a cornerstone of our office is to provide free uh, education to rural health care providers. Um, just some housekeeping announcements for a more collegial environment. We'll use first names only. Please be conscious of uh, protected health information. Um, keep yourself on mute until you're ready to speak. And when you do say uh, speak, just say your name so we know who's talking. Um, if you ever have any cases, please feel free to share them. We do have a case form in the follow-up email. Uh, also, I will send a follow-up email after this with the slides and your CME claiming information. And with that, I would like to welcome you all to today's uh, TB session. And thank you, uh, Peter, for being here today. We appreciate your time. No problem. Glad to do it again for you. This is uh, this will be a good one because um, we're going to do a little bit different today than <clears throat> some of the prior lectures that I gave. So uh, as mentioned, we're going to talk about tuberculosis and latent TB. Next slide. I have no conflicts to report. Next slide. Well, prior, put one right before. Okay. So the objectives are we're going to uh, talk about a presentation of somebody with active TB and then we're going to discuss the risk factors for tuberculosis infection and disease, and then discuss uh, the diagnosis of TB, as well as the therapy of TB. And then at the end, we're going to discuss latent TB, both the presentation, diagnosis, and therapy. So there's a lot of information we're going to get today. So next slide. So the way I've designed this talk is we're gonna do it with a case and we're gonna kind of go through a case, but then discuss the different aspects of TB based on a case that we're gonna have throughout. So this will be a little bit different. So this is JW. He's a 27 year old male brought to the emergency department from the county jail. He was arrested for producing methamphetamines 10 days ago. Since his arrest, he has been coughing considerably and the cough is now productive of a clear thick sputum with occasional drops of blood. He, he has no congestion, no sinus pain. He has not vomited. He has no diarrhea and no rash. His appetite has decreased, however, and JW believes he may have lost about five to 10 pounds in the last few months. He does not remember having a fever, but he is not sleeping well and often wakes up sweaty with the sheets tangled. So this individual, basically, uh, just to kind of summarize, he was brought in from the county jail because of the cough he's had, which initially was clear, but now it's starting to change and there's blood in the sputum as well. And he's just not feeling well and he's been losing weight. And so there was a concern that he might have some kind of a respiratory infection of some kind. Next slide. His past medical history, he's healthy. He has vaccinations that are all up to date. He had a history of tonsillectomy. Social history, he has a, been a smoker of at least two packs per day for the last 10 years. So he's been a heavy smoker. Drinks beer occasionally on the weekends. And he does use recreational marijuana and methamphetamines. He lives in Jackson County with his girlfriend, uh, his six-month-old daughter and his girlfriend's three-year-old daughter. And then his family history, his parents are not around, uh, but there is heart disease and type 2 diabetes um, in the family. Next slide. So go back one, uh, Renee. Okay, so just to kind of summarize this case, you know, when you're thinking about a respiratory infection, you know, you're thinking about you know, uh, could it be, uh, you know, upper or lower respiratory? Could it be a sinus infection? Could it be something, you know, pharyngitis? Or is it more of a bronchitis or even a uh, pneumonia for that reason? And so this patient comes in with this cough. Now, it's not acute because it's been going on 
you know, for several days. You know, it's not something that came about 24 hours ago or 48 hours like you'd expect with certain bacterial infections. But it's been going on for several days, even over a week. And uh, he doesn't complain about anything else. There's no congestion or sinus pain. So it appears to be localized in his lower respiratory tract. And uh, again, that blood in the sputum makes it a little bit more concerning. So, you know, in the workup of this patient, obviously, you know, they're going to do a physical exam and everything. Uh, but the uh, most important thing is when you're suspecting a respiratory kind of an infection would be getting a chest x-ray to see if there's an infiltrate. This can help you differentiate a bronchitis, say, where there's just, you know, cough and sputum production, but there's no infiltrate on chest. And on a chest x-ray, you'd find uh, normal, you wouldn't find any infiltrates versus a pneumonia of some kind. So a chest x-ray was done. Next slide. We do have a question if they were, oh, go ahead. If they were born in the U.S. Yes, this patient was born in the U.S. And that's a great question, too, because I think, you know, where we're heading with this is who are the high risk individuals for tuberculosis? And that's a high risk individual if they were born outside of the United States. So that's a very, very good question. Thank you for that. Nope, they were born in the United States. So this is the chest X-ray. And what you'll see here is you'll see you know, the cardiac uh, shadow there, but you'll see the infiltrate is basically up in the upper apices of the lung or yeah, of the lung there. And it's, 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 it's patchy and there might even be those clear spaces up there could be little cavities up there. So it's kind of a unique infiltrate. And then you'll see also on that same side of the chest, you might see a couple, you know, that, that hyler change, it could be a hyler uh, lymph node, but the infiltrate itself with the patient's symptoms really are very, very suggestive of a chronic type pneumonia and a tuberculous pneumonia. Because when you think about where does TB occur, TB occurs when you initially, when a person initially gets infected with TB, called a primary infection, they get like an infiltrate nonspecific anywhere in the lung. But when you have a reactivation TB where they've already had it and now it's reactivating, it usually occurs in the apices of the lung. And that's really very classic for TB, unlike any other pathogens. Now, you could argue and say, well, you could see cancer in that area, potentially occasional fungus, but the most common cause would be tuberculosis. So based on this patient symptoms, cough chronically, blood in the sputum, and then those, those uh, sweats he was talking about are what's known as night sweats. And you see that almost always described with somebody with tuber you know, active tuberculosis. So this is a very, very suggestive case based on those symptoms of a person with tuberculosis, active TB. Is there any other questions? Because this is, like I said, uh, very important that everybody understand this. And it's a reactivation, meaning that the patient was more likely than not exposed at some time and never was diagnosed like with latent TB and then this just reactivated. So next slide. So what is your differential diagnosis and what is your most likely diagnosis? And I'm gonna say, when you're thinking about differential, you're thinking this is not an acute condition. So those of you that think, well, could this be a, strep pneumonia? Could this be a pseudomonas pneumonia? Could this be a uh, influenza pneumonia? Those are acute presentations. Those patients get sick, but within a couple days after symptoms, they have high fevers, chills, sputum productive, you know, thick purulent sputum, not necessarily blood, but thick purulent, and uh, legionella, chlamydia, uh, those kind of uh, uh, atypical pneumonias uh, will still present with more of an acute process, maybe not the thick sputum, but still with more of acute, you know, cough, fever, those kind of symptoms. What we're looking at is a chronic condition that's been going on for several days over a week. And now we're into the category of TB, atypical TB, maybe a fungal infection. You know, you could even put, I guess, cancer in the differential since he's a smoker of 10 packs, although you'd expect them to have symptoms even longer than that. And then what is your most likely diagnosis based on the blood in the sputum, 
the uh, 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 the the night sweats, uh, chronicity. Uh, I would have to select probably tuberculosis. Next slide. And this gives you the long list. We've kind of talked a lot about this. So you can eliminate a lot of the bacterial causes and the other causes like mycoplasma. Plus, none of those bacterial causes nor mycoplasma, chlamydia, uh, chlamydiophilia, or legionella are going to produce that kind of a chest infiltrate. TB definitely will. And as far as the different fungi, histo, blasto, crypto, usually in, in this part of the country, uh, I would have expected crypto to, or uh, histo to be the number one uh, uh, fungus because it usually occurs in, uh, you know, Indiana, Ohio River, Mississippi Valley area. Um, blasto occurs more in the south or in the central northern areas like Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota those kind of areas. And then crypto can almost occur anywhere. But, you know, usually you'll get a exposure history, you know, patients cave exploring, you know, uh, bird exposures, things like that. So that would be a chronic pneumonia sometimes. But usually the infiltrates that form there are nodular, <coughs> excuse me, and they have large lymph nodes too in the hilar area, but they're nodular infiltrates, not apical like we saw in this case. And so the, this is where, like I said, you can, based on the history, the physical, and the chest X-ray, uh, you know, TB would be probably your most likely uh, um, cause. So where do we go from here? Next slide. So JW is admitted to a negative pressure room. This is important. Whenever you suspect a person with active TB, you want to take them out of you know, any exposure. You want to put him in an isolated room. I mean, if he can't be admitted or there's a problem admitting, he has to go home and be put in an isolated room where he's not exposing anybody else to this particular organism. Because like I said, when you have TB active, and especially if it's in an area like the apices where there's a potential cavity, these individuals are highly infectious. And so you want to put them in a in an isolated room and a negative pressure room where that'll reduce the amount of active TB even when he's coughing in that room. Now, this case, the patient was treated for a pneumonia. The ceftriaxone and azithromycin are used to treat a community-acquired pneumonia. So the clinicians involved in this felt that maybe he had a pneumonia on top of uh, uh, TB. So they wanted to play it safe with him. So they put him on antibiotics uh, and then they did routine testing. They tested them for a lot of different uh, uh, agents, and then they got an infectious disease uh, consult as well. So this is why that negative pressure room is important. So always remember that when you suspect or you see somebody in your clinic and you suspect the active TB, you've got to, if, if uh, uh, there's an unstable housing or room or anything, then you have to admit them, but admit them to a negative pressure room so that there's no exposure to anybody else. Next slide. How are you going to confirm the diagnosis? What specimen do you want to collect? What testing do you want? And then in general, what other testing do you want? So more specifically, how are you going to do, you know, what are you going to want to test for on the, uh, on this patient? And the basic thing is for TB, you're going to want to get a good, sputum, not just spit, not just phlegm that, you know, you want to get a good deep sputum. And again, you're going to be careful when you have that person coughing and stuff like that. You're going to want to wear a mask and be very cautious, but you're going to want to get a good sputum. And you probably want to get a couple sputums just in case one doesn't show what you want it to. By getting three, you reduce the false negativity rate cons uh, considerably. And you're going to want to take it. You're going to want to have them do an acid fast stain, because there's all kinds of different stains that can be done, Graham stain, uh, KOH stain, different stains. But you're if you don't specifically say what you want, they'll just do a regular routine Graham stain on them, and that'll be it. And a Graham stain will be negative, I can guarantee it. So you're going to want to do an acid fast stain on this person, and you're going to want to do that, uh, like I said, on the different specimens that you get. The other testing that you're going to want to consider is 
what other tests can help you define whether this person's been exposed to TB or not? Well, that's your PPD testing and your or your quantiferon test. And we'll talk more in detail about those two tests later on. But those tests check you for exposure to TB. So that if this individual had a TB test, a PPD test, and uh, it was positive, or a quantiferon, it was positive. That by itself indicates the patient has TB. He's been infected with TB. But it doesn't say that he has the active disease where he's actively showing signs of TB. It could be active, but then it could be latent. So you need more information. But the, 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 the two tests that I mentioned should be positive in this patient. The only reason they would be negative is if this patient was severely immunocompromised, like an AIDS patient, where he couldn't mount any T cells that would show up positive on those tests. So that would be the only, but the majority of cases, and like JW, he should have a reactive PPD and IGRA test. Other tests you're gonna to wanna to do probably is just a routine CBC and CMP just to check his liver enzymes, kidney function and that, just because of the fact that if you put him on therapy, you're gonna to wanna to make sure his organs are working well and things like that as well. So those are the important tests to consider. Any questions so far on that? Next slide. And there you go. That's the Zeal Nelson or acid fast stain. And what you see on this stain is acid fast bacilli. They're red. They're like little red snappers, they call them. And uh, if you did a gram stain, it would be negative because gram stain doesn't pick up the, the organisms, the, the, the uh, TB doesn't pick up that stain. So the, you'd look at the uh, gram stain and it'd be completely negative. But the acid fast, it's picked up by the TB organisms, so they're red. Now, here's another important point. Could you say 100%? Um, yeah, and that's a good thing from Sharon, who says wear a respirator, N95 or CAPR, not a mask, because the masks, as we know, through... Uh, with COVID, you know, aren't as protective against these organisms as a N95 and a Capri mask. So that's extremely important for those of you that, you know, are going to, you know, ha have yourself exposed to somebody like this. You're going to want to make sure you wear the proper mask to reduce your exposure as much as you can. So my point here, though, is that um, this acid fast bacillus, you've probably heard about non or, or atypical mycobacteria like mycobacteria. Kansasii, Mycobacterium avium, Intracellulari, Mycobacterium, um, uh, oh God, there's several of them. Uh, but these are not the typical TB organism. Those atypicals do not, aren't contagious to normal people. They infect people with underlying conditions. They infect people with uh, immunocompromised conditions. Like I have HIV patients that have those. Uh, and they can cause lung infections as well. So, Highly unlikely that JW has one of those, but to be fully, you know, uh, clear with you, this tells you he's got TB uh, or mycobacteria, but not necessarily mycobacteria TB. Where you have to go with this sputum is one more step, and you have to send it off for cultures, but you also do what's called a nucleic acid amplification test. And the NAT test really uh, gives you more info or gives you information and it will clarify whether it's TB or atypical TB because the NAT test tests for the genes of the organism. So it's much, much more specific. So you're going to want to do the NAT test and cultures. And why do you need cultures? Because that'll tell you if the TB is sensitive to the agent you want to put them on. And we'll talk about the treatment in just a second. So that's how you would handle this particular case so far. Next slide. Why do you think this patient has TB? What are some risk factors for TB? And we're going to talk about that in, in, in the next slide here. But uh, that's an important point. The fact that, you know, he is he a high risk for TB, given what I've told you? And, you know, remember, he was uh, an IV drug user <coughs> or a drug user. He was in jail for a while. Um, so, you know, those are risk factors for 
you know, uh, considering, and, and if you did have latent TB, those are risk factors for a person with latent TB developing active TB because all people with latent TB don't become active. It's very few, but there are patients that do become active and those are the ones that have risk factors. And then how does active TB develop? And we'll talk about that in a second as well. Next slide. So these are the risk factors. That's why the first question I had was, did he have, you know, did he come from another country? And this is so important question now because we're seeing more and more and more immigrants coming in from all over the world. And in the health department I work at at Ingham County, we're getting them a lot now from everywhere, from Haiti, from Cuba, from Africa, India, uh, all over. And, they, and many of these countries are very endemic for tuberculosis. Matter of fact, in, in my HIV arena, uh, when we look at patients with HIV in other countries outside of the United States, the main opportunistic infection is not pneumocystis, it's tuberculosis and crypto. So TB is very, very common in those particular areas there. So you always have to uh, ask yourself, you know, are they you know, did they immigrate from a high risk area or from a high incidence country? And we'll talk about which countries are high risk in a minute. Are they immunosuppressed? Do they have AIDS? Do they have, are they on chemotherapy for cancer? Do Are they on one of those TNF agents, tumor necrosis factor inhibitor agents for rheumatoid arthritis? As you know, whenever you put a person on one of those agents now, they want you to have a PPD done prior to make sure they don't have TB, uh, latent TB. Are they travelers to high risk in, in countries? You know, do they, uh, you know, have they been to some where maybe they went and did a, a, sabbatic, a sabbatical or something uh, in India, for instance, or in somewhere in Africa where TB is very, very high risk. And then, like I said, you know, the immuno uh, suppressive condition and the other thing that can immunosuppress you if you're on long-term steroids, if you're on greater than 20 milligrams of prednisone for over two weeks, that would consider you a high-risk individual that would be immunosuppressed based on that amount of steroids for that period of time. Homeless shelters, illicit drug use, and correctional facilities. So our, our, our patient, JW, would be considered somebody that illicit drug use as well as a resident of a correctional facility. So he meets, meets the criteria of a risk factor for TB infection. Next slide. And this right away shows you some of the uh, areas there. You can see that the darker the color, the dark red, the incidence is over 300 per 100,000 population cases. So you can see there, you know, uh, Siberia, for instance, you can see India, uh, you can see, uh, uh, Africa has a real dark red areas in different areas of uh, both South Africa as well as Central Africa and Western Africa. They're really dark red. Uh, so those are high, high risk areas. And then the next color down, we talked about India and some of the other uh, Asian countries as well. And then when we go to the uh, orange, uh, the 50 to 99, we see that, you know, again, there's a a lot of areas, and I'm not very good at geography, but uh, again, you can see that a lot of those areas uh, in the Middle East and Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and all that uh, can be high risk, China, uh, those areas. Uh, and then if we look at uh, the United States itself, we're down to one to 24. Uh, but, but the majority of new cases, I said, I think, are coming from the you know, Pat, fact that as we get more and more and more immigrants coming to the United States, we're going to probably see more and more and more cases of tuberculosis. So I think as primary care providers, it's very, very, very important that you do screening, do the quantiferon screening on all these patients. And if they maintain high risk activities, like they're drug abusers or live in homeless shelters or things, then rescreening them again is very important as well. Maybe once every year, once every six months, because this is the only way you're going to diagnose them. And I was reading articles recently where the screening is not being done. It's not being done. We're not doing the proper screening. They're saying the primary care providers are really dropping the ball as far as doing the proper screening in these high-risk individuals. So you really have to consider that now because of the fact that we're seeing a change in the environment and things like that.
Next slide. So this is the basic pathophysiology. So we've got our exposure history. So a patient with, uh, um, you know, is exposed to TB. And the highly infectious TB cases are the ones that have uh, a big cavity. Those are the most infectious. And then the ones that have laryngeal TB. I saw a case during my fellowship or residency where the <laughs> a patient was uh, brought in and he had, he had, uh, he, he lost his voice and hoarseness and they uh, worked him up and uh, he, uh, he had a mass on his larynx. And so they took him to surgery there and I'll never forget the surgeon was there and he was, uh, you know, using his little tool to get rid of the secretion, you know, you know, spraying things and everything and saying how classic this was for a laryngeal carcinoma. And he went ahead and, you know, biopsied it and everything and sent it off for pathology. And lo and behold, did it show laryngeal carcinoma? No, it showed multiple granulomas that tested positive for AFB. He had laryngeal tuberculosis and three of the, I don't know how many people were there, but three people converted positive on their quantiferon uh, after that expo or after that exposure. So laryngeal TB is highly infectious. Uh, cavitary TB is, is infectious as well. But you can see there after exposure, depending upon the degree and the extent, 30% um, will become infected with it. And of that 30%, 5 to 10% will develop primary TB or active tuberculosis. But the majority, 90 to 95%, will develop latent TB, which is called contained or persistent TB. And then you can see as we go down further, the uh, patients that go from latent TB to active TB, 10% occur in healthy adults, 20% occur in children less than five years of age, 30% occur in HIV positive individuals, and 40% occur in children less than two years. So those young children and immunocompromised patients tend to be the two big populations that will go from latent TB to reactivation TB. And our patient, JW, fit that category. He had latent undiagnosed TB and then went on to develop reactivation TB. And by treating latent TB with either INH or AFAMP, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, you will reduce the incidence of reactivation by an enormous amount, you know, 90%. I mean, so it really behooves you to test people for latent TB and then give them that treatment because you will reduce the incidence of reactivation dramatically. And then you can see there that other conditions that can occur in tuberculosis is extrapulmonary TB, where you get TB lymphadenitis or TB uh, bone disease or TB renal disease, which is usually occurs in more immunocompromised patients. I've seen this occur in my AIDS patients. And then miliary TB is where they have these little miliary nodules uh, throughout the lungs and not cavitary or things. It's more hematogenously spread. So this is the basic pathogenesis of how TB occurs and how it's uh, spread and what the definitions are of primary TB versus latent TB versus reactivation TB. Questions? All right, next slide. So this again goes with the, this is a simplistic slide that talks about exposure and then the risk factors you know, that, that may make you at a higher risk for developing because, like I said, you know, 30% will develop infection, but then where do they go from there? And so if you get go into latent TB, you know, this is where the TB is persistent but contained, and that's where 90% of individuals will go. <clears throat> but the risk factors to develop active TB, we've already gone over. And that's mainly somebody very young, less than two years of age, 40%, or somebody with HIV, which would be 30%. And I can tell you that somebody with AIDS, it's going to be even higher than 40%. It'll be probably 50%. And people on high-dose steroids, people on TNF agents, people on uh, immunochemotherapy, et cetera, 
are high risk factors for developing active TB from latent TB. Next slide. And this is a nice picture because what it shows you is the different stages. So latent TB is where you do have TB, okay? So a person with latent TB, you do a chest X-ray and you say, oh, chest X-ray is normal, don't see anything. And, you know, you do some sputums, they're negative, and you say, oh, you don't have TB. They do have TB. It's just contained, okay? It's contained and more likely than not never will reactivate. But they have TB. The next stage is where they develop more active TB. And in, in the next stage, this is... Uh, uh, a relapser. This is relapsing or cavitary TB where you see the cavity there. And those are highly infectious. Those cavities, will really, they have loaded TB organisms. The final one, miliary TB, is where it develops in some extra pulmonary area and then spreads through the bloodstream. And what all those little dots are are granulomas. Now, surprisingly, you may say, oh my God, that must be the most infectious. But really, they're all contained. They're not uh, communicating with any bronchus. So really those people aren't as infectious as somebody with cavitary TB because they're all contained in these little granulomas in the lung that aren't really connected to a bronchus where they would be more contagious. So those are the definitions. Next slide. And this gives you a nice view of primary TB. The, the lesion on the left where it says stop, think, that is what's called a gong focus. You may have heard about it, and it's where they develop that little infiltrate, you know, that's more up in the, uh, uh, it's it's toward the um, um, uh, upper uh, upper segment there. It's, it's like a little infiltrate that then has that little string that connects it more toward the left area there, and that's where the lymph node is at. And that's where you have an infiltrate with a little connection to the lymph node, which is the gone focus. And that's usually one of the signs of primary tuberculosis. The slide on the left or on the right are showing massive hyalur adenopathy. And, and so in some patients, not all patients, but in some patients with primary tuberculosis, they will present with that kind of a picture as well and uh, and uh, and sometimes they'll present with TB in lymph nodes in the in the uh, 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 axilla and in this uh, thing in the uh, neck and everything else. Um, and just to give you another example, I had a patient that had AIDS came to me with AIDS. T cells that were very 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 low, and uh, he um, came in with diffuse lymph nodes. I mean, he had big lymph nodes in his neck under his arms. You know, and uh, we did a chest x-ray and sure enough, he had a, a big lymph nodes in his chest. And we thought for sure, I thought for sure he had lymph lymphoma. I thought, man, there's no question he has lymphoma. Well, we went ahead and biopsied one of his lymph nodes, AFB, massive, loaded with AFB. No granulomas because he couldn't mount an inflammatory reaction, but he had AFB everywhere. And his history was he was a positive, he was a latent TB guy that actually was treated he gave, they gave, gave him INH for six months or whatever, but because he became so immunosuppressed, there's not a hundred percent, you know, uh, there's not a hundred percent that says you're going to get cured from TB. And since he became so immunosuppressed, he reactivated his TB and he developed TB adenitis everywhere. And he had hyalur TB and uh, miliary TB as well, along with his AIDS. He never had lymphoma. So you can imagine if we never, which you never would do anyway, but if for God's sakes, somebody says, well, let's just start him on chemo right away. He's got lymph nodes everywhere. He would have died very, very quickly because the chemo would have totally immunosuppressed him and he would have just died. So just as a matter of fact, next slide. So JW is currently in the hospital. So now we've got JW diagnosed. He's got active tuberculosis. However, remember he was living with his girlfriend and two young children. The health department is notified of a potential TB case with household exposures. So you can't just end it with diagnosing JW, put him in the hospital, put him in a negative pressure room and say, okay, we're gonna start treating you. You gotta find out where did he live? Who did he live with? Who was he exposed to? Because this individual with that chest X-ray 
those all those individuals have to be screened immediately. Next slide. What testing should be done for the girlfriend and the two children in the household? Well, if we're gonna, if the patient, or if the the um, uh, girlfriend and the children are asymptomatic, then you got to say, uh, do they have latent TB? And so, what you should do is the skin test, either the PPD or the uh, quantiferon. And then probably, even to be safe, maybe do a chest X-ray and sputums, especially if they have any symptoms or you're 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 suspicious because sometimes they may not have symptoms and still have evidence of early active TB. So that's how you would approach a TB evaluation. And what are some of the symptoms of active TB? Next slide. So consider TB. Do they have symptoms? If they don't, then it's most likely latent. And then you can do either the skin test, which is a TCS or TCTST, or the quantiferon, which is the uh, interferon uh, test. And the I'll talk about the advantages, disadvantages of both uh, tests. But if either one of them is positive and you want to exclude active TB, then you follow up with the chest X-ray and three sputum samples. If they already have symptoms like JW, then you assume they have active TB, and then you go ahead and do your workup like was done on JW, and then work them up that way. So that's basically how you would uh, work them up. Uh, the reason why the TST is uh, not done as frequently now is it's not quite as sensitive, even specific, as the quantiferon test. And the only time you might want to do the TST test is in an individual less than two years of age because they don't have enough mature lymphocytes to respond to the uh, uh, TB and inform a positive vigor. But other than that, you should probably be ordering the quantiferon in most of your patients unless for some reason they can't afford it or whatever. Next slide. <laughs> TB symptoms, a bad cough, especially if it's chronic, three weeks or longer, pain in the chest, coughing up blood, tiredness, weight loss, decreased appetite, sweating at night, fevers. Usually the fevers are low grade. They're 100, not 102, 103, like you'd see bacterial, but they're low grade. But those are the symptoms. And remember, JW had a cough, a persistent cough for a couple of weeks. He was coughing up blood. He was weak and tired. He had weight loss and no appetite and sweating at night. So he had many of the symptoms listed here. And so those are the ones you want to get, even on the patients that were exposed to JW as well, to see if they have any of those symptoms whatsoever. Next slide. So what part of the immune system is targeted by the skin test or the quantiferon test? And the answer is, it's the T cells. So when we're talking about different parts of our immune system and how they respond, the T cells are is what responds to tuberculosis. When you talk about bacterial infections like pneumococcus and pseudomonas and uh, different organisms like that. It's the antibodies that respond as well as the granulocytes. Those are mainly involved in bacterial infections. But for things like tuberculosis and many fungal infections, it's the T cells. And that's how the two tests are designed, the tuberculin test and the PPD test. And so we're going to talk about more detail about these tests so you understand them more. Next slide. So this is just a summary of what I just said. So we can go all the way over to type four. So type four is the reaction that you would get with either an interferon test uh, or a quantiferon test or a skin test. And this is where it's a T cell mediated inflammatory reaction. And that's where people that have um, <clears throat> defects in those systems, you know, are at higher risk for developing extensive tuberculosis. So that's why AIDS patients 
are at extremely high risk because that's what's damaged their T cells. And then if you have patients on prolonged steroids, they get uh, damage to their T cells. Uh, patients on those tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, like people with inflammatory bowel disease or rheumatoid arthritis, that TNF agent reduces their T cell activity. So though all the conditions that reduce T cell activity or T cells in general will increase your risk for active, aggressive tuberculosis. Next slide. And this is a nice example, just so you understand, when they do the skin test, the tuberculin proteins, it's uh, basically a tuberculin protein that's extracted from a TB organism is, is injected into the dermis. And then if the, and then the skin is examined 48 to 72 hours later for an immune response. Now, you see it's done superficially. You can't do it deep. You can't allow most of the fluid to uh, leak out. That's the problem with the PPD. There can be so much variability in how it's done and who does it. Plus, you have to have the patient come back in one to two, in, in two to three days to have it read. They can't just disappear. Next slide. And this is important. So this is how it's done. You can see that what happens is, is that if you got, let's just say that the person came back to you in uh, less than 24 hours and they said, oh my God, I must have TB. And it's why, because look at the, where you injected the, the PPD, but the whole area is red. It's not indurated, it's red. And you put your finger across and it's flat. There's no induration. That's a reaction to the to the TB, it's like a little allergic reaction. It's not a TB response by any stretch. So what has to occur is, is that you inject that TB proteins in there. And then over the next couple of days, you get T cells migrating to that area. And you see where that little yellow dot is, where it's this small bleb develops. Those are the TB, those are the T cells that are reacting now to that purified protein derivative. And depending upon how much uh, immune reaction you have as to how large the lesions are. So five to nine <clears throat> would be something that you'd say, well, that's probably not positive. Well, if they have AIDS, if they have an immunosuppressive condition that they don't have good T cell function or they have low T cells, that's a positive reaction. Now, if they're just normal, if they have no immunosuppressive condition and you're just looking in general, then 10 to 14 millimeters is positive. Now, some of the things that may cause a false positive, usually five to nine, would be if you had BCG given as a vaccine, which is done to many immigrants, or you have atypical TB, TB mycobacterium kansasii or avium intracelluli. So the test is not as specific as you would like it. That's why in those cases, you would look at a higher reaction, like a 10 to 14 millimeter response. And the CDC says, even if you've had a prior BCG, if you have a 10 to 14 millimeter, that's latent TB or active TB until proven otherwise. The greater than 15 is just somebody, category three applies somebody that's living in a bubble that's never been exposed to anybody with anything, anytime. But yeah, you concentrate more on the 10 to 14 is your most common skin reaction. Next slide. So this is where you kind of try to evaluate the skin test. If it's initially negative, and if you feel like this patient is immunosuppressed and they just didn't have enough T cells to react to the initial uh, PPD, then what you can do is you can uh, give them another dose, administer a second TST. And then if they have a positive reaction at that point, then that's considered a boosted reaction and it implies that the patient is positive. If they're negative, then that implies that they don't have TB and you just have to consider and complete, you know. Now, the only sequence to this is if they've been positive or I mean, if their TB is, I mean, if their immunosuppression is severe, like when I have AIDS patients with T cells less than 50, normals 500, they won't even react to a booster. So I don't even bother with this test. I just go right to the quantiferon test. Next slide. This is the quantiferon test. I don't want to go over a lot of specifics. All I want you to tell, all I want to tell you is the mechanism. This is more sensitive and specific. Why? Because they take the patient's actual T cells, 
and they the T cells, if they, indeed they've been exposed to TB, they'll they'll be memory cells. They'll have the memory that they've been exposed to TB, and that's the little purple things. And they put them in a tube and they incubate them for a while. And then what they do is they stimulate them to produce interferon. And if the interferon, the interferon, if it's interferon that's been exposed to TB, it'll show up that way. And and they they actually expose the uh, the the the, the uh, lymphocytes to uh, a TB product, and 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 then that's where they measure the interferon. So it's an actual measure of the interferon produced by the lymphocytes, and so that's why it's much more specific sensitive. The concept is the same. They still stimulate it with a uh, uh, you know with a uh, um, um, you know a, a, a TB protein but then they measure the actual interferon produced. Next slide. So here's the advantage. The quantiferon is a one visit. There's no cross reaction. So they could have been exposed to BCG. They could have had atypical TB, but the interferon produced is specific for TB. And so that's basically because those cells have been exposed to TB. It is more expensive. And you have to take it to the lab at appropriate time because if you let it sit on the counter or do something, you can get a false positive. And it's not approved for less than two years of age because those kids don't have mature lymphocytes. So it's basically the test I use 100% of the time. The TST, there's two visits required. You can have false positives due to a cross reaction or more likely, you know, sometimes a false negative if the T cells are too low. Matter of fact, the IGRA, will be more sensitive with T cells less than 200 than the TST test is. And so the only time I would ever use it, and I don't use it, is if the patient, for whatever reason, can't afford the IGRA test, or they're less than two years, and I don't see pediatrics. So I would just use the quantiferon test. Next slide. And that just kind of summarizes the two tests, you know, looking at the tuberculin skin test and how it's done versus the uh, measuring the interferon gamma and how those tests are done. Next slide. So the health department calls and Jay's W sputum is positive for acid fast bacilli. The PCR test was done and confirmed a TB complex. You can do either a PCR or what's known as a nucleic acid amplification test, a NAT test, and that'll give you a testing much quicker than a culture will, and it'll differentiate typical from atypical TB. The culture was set up, but it usually takes well, six to eight weeks to show. And then the quantiferon tests were done on the girlfriend and the three-year-old and were both positive. Chest x-rays were done and both red as negative. So it looks like they both have latent TB. The little baby, unfortunately, had an abnormal chest x-ray and was admitted to pediatrics for further care. So we have three different scenarios. JW is definitely positive. The girlfriend, a three-year-old, has latent TB, and the little baby now has an abnormal chest X-ray, which we have to worry about. Next slide. How do you want to treat JW, and what medications are you going to start? And the same thing goes for the girlfriend and three-year-old. We're going to talk about the medications in just a second, but you're going to treat with four drugs for JW. For the young lady and her three-year-old, you're going to change. You're going to check and probably just treat for latent TB, and we'll go over that in just a second. And then how do you monitor the patient? Next slide. So this is treating latent TB. And what you'll see here is the drugs on the left, and the main drugs that are used are either INH or rifampin. And what you'll see is different scenarios here. So if you do INH, most of the time you'll treat for between six and nine months. Now, all my HIV patients that have latent TB, I treat for nine months because no matter, even if their T cells are normal, I consider them somewhat immunocompromised. But you can determine what your status is, but minimum would be six months. And uh, that's assuming, you know, the, you can do it daily or twice weekly, depending on how you want to do the regimen here. If there, and then you have to change the dose, obviously, if you just do it twice a day, twice weekly. If you use rifampin, you can shorten the duration, <coughs> excuse me, to four months. But remember, rifampin has a lot of drug-drug interactions. 
newer agents, and you can see the INH rifapintine, that's using two drugs. And you can use that once a week for people that are really non-adherent. And you can treat them only for three months. But again, you have to treat with two drugs and you have to be careful. And what I do when I treat with any of these drugs is I measure liver enzymes once a month because both drugs, INH and rifampin, can cause liver enzyme elevation. So I measure that once a month. And with INH, I give them B6 because they can occasionally develop a neuropathy as well. That's with INH, that is. And so I give them B6 during their uh, therapy as well. So that's treating latent TB. Next slide. And by treating latent TB, you see what the cost is. Four to $600 for latent TB versus 18,000 to treat active TB. Next slide. This is our patient JW. And basically you're treating them with four drugs. And I'm not gonna go through all the different regimens there, but just to summarize. Basically the four drugs that are used most commonly are isoniazid, rifampin, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol, four drugs. Once you get, um, usually within six to eight weeks, you'll get your sensitivities back. If it's a very sensitive organism, then you can cut down two of the four drugs and just go with INH rifampin and then treat for the duration of six months total. And so that's the most common regimen used. I don't want to, there's different ways of treating that uh, that are listed there, you know, whether you do it seven days or three times weekly. And I'm not going, I just want you to develop or understand the principles of treatment. And each drug has different side effects. INH rifampin are mainly liver enzymes. You have to educate a patient that's on rifampin that they may have orange colored urine and secretions and if they have cat, if they have, um, uh, you know, I, um, what are they called? Not cataracts, but, uh, you know, the eye, um, you know, um, instead of glasses, sometimes they can stain those uh, devices. And so you have to warn them of that because of the orange discoloration. It's not harmful, but it can cause some, you know, a little bit of alarm. PZA, pyrazinamide can cause an enhancement or, you know, uh, of gout. And it can also cause uh, patients to have liver enzyme elevation. And ethambutol, you have to be careful with color blindness. So you don't like giving it to pediatrics because they can't complain about change in vision. So that's that. Next slide. So JW was started on INH, rifampin, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, as well as B6 for neuropathy. Now, uh, after two weeks, his acid fast smear is negative. He can take it out of isolation. He is sent home and to follow up at the health department. Next slide. The girlfriend was given rifampin for latent TB and is put on a four-month regimen. The three-year-old is treated with INH and a plan to reassess uh, IGRA and chest X-ray in, in a month. And then the baby was found to have hyaluronidus. And uh, since everything's still pending, she was felt to be enough at risk. So she was started on INH, Rifamp, and pyrazinamide, a three-drug regimen. And remember, because she's so young, she wasn't given uh, Thambutol because she can't complain of colorblindness. So those are the regimens used. I mean, there's a lot of others you could do and everything, but this is what the status of these three patients were. Next slide. So hopefully this was an educational program. It was a little different than I usually do uh, because I usually do a lot of just uh, lecturing and then bring cases at the end. But this was kind of following a case through the entire course of tuberculosis, active TB as far as well as talking about what latent TB is and how to differentiate it and how to test them. So that's uh, basically it. So thank you very much. Questions, comments? Thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, please go ahead and come off mute or type it in the chat and we will gladly talk about them.
And all, and this is another thing, please. Um, yes, and uh, they asked if they can use shots of the slides for education. And I think you'll uh, you take care of that, won't you, Renee? Yep. Yep, so you uh, you will get the PDF version of the slides right after, um, sometime this afternoon. And uh, remember to always test people with TB too, because, or test them for HIV. I'm just on this HIV thing and, and I just want to eradicate it. So please do all the testing you can for HIV as well. So that's my final comment. Thank you. Have a good day. And thanks, thanks for, for everybody here. coming again with this kind of uh, audience. I'll continue to do this every month. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.